So in the past, we learned how to create sketches or 2D profiles, which are needed for many of 3D features. And uh, not all of the 3D features need basically a sketch, but most of them do. So the goal here is to uh, use the sketches that we have learned how to make and convert them to a 3D object using different commands. The simplest of all is called extrude, which basically you uh, have a profile and then uh, move the profile or extrude the profile in a direction that is either normal to the plane of the sketch or at angle with respect to the plane of sketch and then what you will get is a prismatic surface okay so in a prism if you cut the object at any height the cross section is going to be the same okay so what we will get is either a uh, basically right prism or oblique prism depending on the direction of extrusion but that's what we get wherever we cut the prism we get the same cross section which is the same as what the original sketch that you used right so if we let's say extrude the rectangle then we get the cube if we extrude the circle we're going to get the cylinder and so on and so forth right so that's the simplest command but the simple command has so many options and i'm going to go through them and provide you with uh, instructions so here is we started on file new and then part and we are in the part design environment where we have all these features and uh, let's start simple so we select any of the original planes let's say front plane and then click on the sketch then draw a uh, sketch like this and uh, let's make it fully defined so that we keep the habit of uh, fully defining the sketch before using it for anything okay so this is fully defined i exit now and then i use with the sketch selected if you click outside this sketch is not selected now it has to be light blue to be selected so if i select the sketch from the uh, tree it goes light blue now I can click on the extrude command and I can get what? The preview of a box. Now the simplest way to extrude is the blind method, which basically provide a dimension along and the default direction for extrusion is perpendicular to the plane of sketch. So this direction is perpendicular to the front plane and uh, you provide the amount of extrusion right so let's say i want to extrude this for three inches right uh, to the left if i click on this arrow or i click here on this reverse direction it will be in the opposite direction it's still normal to the front plane but backwards instead of forwards right so you can reverse the direction by clicking on this uh, arrow you can also change the amount or you can just drag it and put it to uh, the opposite direction so let's say I want to go two inches in this direction also if you look this is direction one and direction two is actually opposite of that right now there is nothing zero but if you activate this now you can also in the direction two backward direction you can say let's say I want one inch also in that direction right so two inches on the left side of the front plane one inch on the right side okay of the front plane so you can extrude in different directions differently this is the simplest way to do extrusion and this is called the blind method okay and if you okay that there we go i got my object yes so this is the part that you have and now if you see this part the simple part from uh, extrude if you cut it along the uh, normal direction right or if you cut it basically parallel to the front plane with any plane when you cut it the resulting curve is going to be what the same as the original sketch right so if you go here this is the uh, extrude this is the sketch you use for extrude, right? And uh, when you make extrude, the sketch goes hidden. If you want, you can make it visible again, right? So that is the sketch. 
I made it visible. Right, so that's the sketch I use now. If I cut this object, as I said, with any plane that is parallel to the normal plane, I should get a cross section that is what? Basically, the exact same thing as the rectangle, right? That's why we call this object also a prism. So uh, now let me hide this back. And this is a right prism. Now let's look at other options because this command, as I said, has a lot of options. So how do I modify this if I want to modify it? Well, there are two ways. You either modify the sketch or you modify the way that you extrude it. So you can modify it two different ways. If you want to modify the sketch, then you right click here and then choose what? Edit sketch or you right click on the sketch itself and say edit sketch. If you want to modify the way you extrude it, then you click on this other guy, say what? Edit feature. So you can do either one and each one has its own effect. So let's say I want to convert it to a cylinder instead of what? A cube. So I go to sketch. I use control eight to see normal to it. And then I change this from a rectangle. I change it to what? A circle. So I draw a circle centered at the origin. I provide a radius or a diameter. And there we go. Now I exit and I get a what? I get a cylinder, right? So that's one way to modify an extruded object by modifying the sketch. Now, what if I don't want to modify the sketch? I want to modify the way I extruded. So I right click and then what? Edit feature. Now you see two inches on the front, one inch on the back. Now I can change those. Let's say I want four inches on the front and I want like uh, two inches on the back, right? So I can do that. The other thing you can do is to provide the draft angle. So you can go straight with the same cross section. If you provide the draft angle, it's not gonna be a prism anymore because now your um, cross section will be the same shape as the original sketch, but it's gonna be smaller or bigger, okay? So if I click on this draft angle and say, hey, give me a draft and then provide draft, right? Let's say 10 degrees. Now this front part will be a truncated cone. If I check this option, draft outward, then it's gonna be bigger instead of smaller like that. Okay, and I can do the same thing for the back side, right? So let's say this side, I want it at 20 degrees or so. Okay, and then I okay that. So you see the options that I can have. I can extrude, I can provide the draft angle, right? And uh, the other thing I have is, these are all solid objects, but I can also make this object to be what? To be a thin object instead of a thick object. So this time I didn't choose to, but if I want, look, I can, uh, create the same object, but make it a shell, a thin object. How? So first, let me delete this 3D extrude and do it again. So I click on delete, but pay attention. When you do delete, you have one option to check or not check. If you say delete absorbed feature, not only it would delete the extrude, it would also delete the sketch you used for it. So if you want to keep that circle, do not check this option. You see, when I check this, it says, okay, I take care of a sketch one as well for you. If you just want to delete the 3D, not the sketch, do not check this option and say, okay. So now the sketch still remains. And now I can use it again to do extrusion, right? And uh, I can provide the same draft. But this time I check this option says thin feature. And this way I can provide what? a thickness to the wall. So I want like 0.4 inch thickness to the walls. And probably if I rotate it, you can see it already, right? Or let me remove the draft angle so that you can see better. So I want this side to be 0.4 inches. And the thickness here is inward, which means in, uh, or actually yeah, it's outside. So by default, it's outside the sketch. But if you click on this one, you change the direction and what? You will make it inside. Okay, so which direction of the sketch do you want the thickness? Outside the sketch or inside? You can change that. 
The other thing you can do is end caps. So right now, if you OK, it's going to create this hollow cylinder for you. But if you say end caps, it will also close the ends for you and provide the same thickness as what? The rest of the wall. So look, I checked this. And now OK that. Right? So this is a hollow object, but the ends are closed. How can I check? Well, I can either look at the um, wireframe or the view with hidden features, right? Or the other way is I can cut it, right? So we learned that we can do a section view. And when you do a section view, then you can easily see the object, right? So you see it's provided. The interesting thing that uh, here you might uh, be surprised is why is it that the top wall seems to be th thinner than the bottom wall or the side walls, I'm sorry. So that's because of the way we cut. The way we cut is not perfectly parallel to the original sketch. Okay, so you have to make sure it is perfectly parallel. Okay, so you have to, looks right to me, almost. Still, it's not perfect, right? So what is it that when it closes the caps, how much thickness did it use? Because I said 0.4, so the distance between this edge and this edge should be what? 0.4, and I'll show you later. You can use the measure tool to check it. So I want the distance between this edge and this edge, and you see it's 0.43 actually for some reason, and then the distance between this wall and this wall, normal distance is 0.1. Okay, well, again, between these two, uh, yeah, it depends on how it is calculating the distance. It is calculating points here. So I can use um, points probably if it allows me to. So it's between that and this line. Yeah, you see, dy is 0.4. So the walls are not exactly 0.4, okay? The walls are 0.1 instead of 0.4. So pay attention that when you do end caps, it has what? Its own option for thickness of the caps. It's not the same as the thickness of the walls, okay? You can choose that separately. So if you want them also 0.4, you provide 0.4 here. Then you would get exactly what you probably expected. Okay, so the caps have their own thickness. Okay, so we learn about caps, the thickness of the caps, direction one, direction two, draft angle and thin feature, okay? Now, what if you want basically an oblique prism? So if you remember, in this case, I was uh, extruding normal to the front plane and I would get an upright prism. Well, what if I want what? An oblique. So oblique versus right prism. Okay, so that's the difference. Right. So if you have here this pentagon, do you go straight up or do you go at angle? So, so far we made this. Now, what if we want to make it at angle, right? So we have to provide that direction and make it oblique. How? Let me show you. So here, if this is the initial sketch, you also need a separate sketch uh, using which you determine the direction of extrusion. So here I go to a plane perpendicular to the original sketch plane, like right plane, for example. Go to sketch and then draw a line, but make sure this line is at angle with respect to the sketch, something like that, right? And let's say I provide an angle like this, let's say 60 degrees or so, and then I get out. And now I go ahead and choose this original sketch and go to extrude. You see, by default, it is normal too, correct? 
But here, this window, which is direction, if you click on it, now you can choose a line showing the direction. And now I choose this line. There we go. You can see that now I got what? An oblique cylinder, right? So that's how you make an oblique extrusion. One other option you have in extrude or cut extrude is up to a surface or vertex, okay? And this can be actually a very nice feature. So not always when you extrude something, you want all the points on that original sketch to be extruded the same amount, some points less, some point more, until your extrude touches the surface of another feature. So for example, here, uh, let me get rid of this line so that it goes back to uh, vertical. So here, as you can see, all points on that circle are extruded eight inches, okay? Now, sometimes I do not want exactly that to happen. What do I mean? So let's say here I go to the right plane and uh, I draw another cylinder, something like this. And I extrude this guy, make a cylinder too, like that. So now, if you can see, even if I move this behind the previous one, let's see if I can move that. So let me delete this one. That's fine. So, but if you can, uh, yeah, let me delete this. So this was the um, extrude that I made. So five and five. And then this other one, when you want to extrude it, you don't want to go like four or five or six, all of them the same number. Why? Because if you do so, then two objects will penetrate each other, okay? So all you need is actually from that extrusion is this yellow area. Basically what you want, if you look from this view or from the top view, different points on the circle will need to be extruded what? Different amounts so that they touch the surface of the cylinder and after that, you don't need to extrude any further because now the two objects merge together and become one object, right? So it's like a, a T-junction, right? Or it's like a T-connection for pipes. So you do not need to say, hey, go blind 4.8 inches or 5 inches or 6 inches, right? Because again, if you do so, then those two cylinders are overlapping here. So what you do instead of blind, you say, I want it up to surface. And then for surface, I choose this surface. And now if you look, you see the difference, the distance between these points on this curved surface with the original sketch, the distances, which are the amount of extrusions are different. So now I choose that and I get a what? I get a perfect T connection, okay? And now if I look inside it, there is no redundancy, no overlap, there is nothing here, okay? This guy has not continued inside the part. So, and that curve that you can see, that is the intersection of the two cylinders. Okay, so this is how you can get up to surface or up to next, you can say. It will touch the next surface and then uh, it will stop, right? So let me show you that as well. So if instead of up to surface, you say no, up to next, it does the same thing. It goes until it touches the next surface and then stops.
Okay, so up to surface, it can be any surface. Up to next is just the first surface it touches. Or you can say up to vertex or something like that. So this is a nice feature. Now, in addition to these, we have a command which does the exact opposite of extrude. So it hollows out a prism out of the object, okay? It cut extrude the material. So again, for that, you need the sketch. So let's say you go here on this top surface. Now you can use that top surface too to draw what? To draw a sketch and then use that sketch for extrude, cut extrude or anything. So now that you have flat surfaces on the part, you can use those as well as what? your original planes. Not only you can use original planes, you can use the flat, not the curved, only the flat surfaces of the object. And you can also create planes by what? By using the command plane under reference geometry. So if you go, and I, we mentioned it, if you go under reference geometry and plane, now you can create what? Planes with specific properties. Let's say I want a plane with some offset from this. So I click on that and then say, I want one inch offset from this plane. And you see that that's what gives you, or if you say Philip offset, it goes backwards, right? So there are so many things you can do, or let's say, uh, I want that face. If you just select this face, what do you think would happen? It doesn't like it because these two planes have nothing in common that can define a surface. So it's not gonna like it. You can have three references in general to define a plane. And two perpendicular planes like this, they do not do anything. If instead of that, you chose this one. Okay, of course, it has to be your second reference. But if I chose for second reference, phase three, and for the first one, at phase one. Okay, let me do it one more time. So um, I go with this and this. And then the option available is mid plane. So it gives you the plane which is right in between them. So there are too many different ways to define a plane. Okay. As long as you define three, one, two, or up to three references. For example, these three references can be three separate points. If you choose three separate points, then you can have what? A separate plane defined by them. Let me show you that very fast. So one of the points we have is origin, this guy. Let's say I go on this plane and then I this surface and then I create one point here. And then I also create one point there, right? So I use two points on that surface. And now look, I go to the, uh, actually, I guess those two points have to be in two separate sketches. I don't think it allows me to select them individually but we can try. So I choose those two points in that sketch. You see, it does not allow me because each point has to be in a separate sketch. So what I do is I get rid of one of the points. And then on the bottom plane, I also go and make another point. Let's say this one. Okay, so now I have three points on the top, bottom, and the back surface. And now I go to the plane command and I say my first reference is this point. My second reference is this point, And then my third reference is this point. And so it makes sure that your plane passes through what? The three points. Okay, so you can have offset with respect to plane, normal to plane, passing through two lines that are parallel or intersecting or passing through three points. So there are so many different ways to define a plane using the reference geometry plane command. Okay, so there are so many of them. And as we go through this course, I'll show you. Now here, I just want to do a simple cut extrude. So, uh, let me get rid of those points because I really do not need them. And hide this sketch. It's 
So now I go on the surface, go to sketch, and then draw something, let's say a hexagon. Now you see here, I want to make sure the center of the hexagon is the same as the center of the circle. But it does not initially show me the center of the circle, so I don't know where to click. But one of the things you can do is this. If you move your mouse on the boundary of the circle, you see? If you move it on the boundary of the circle, then it shows the center of the circle. Now you can draw your polygon. Okay? And now I can do a what? A cut extrude. So I go to extruded cut, and then I provide the amount of cut that I want. Okay? Again, the simplest method of all is doing a blind so let's say I want six inches and I do that and then what I get a hexagonal hole into the object a pocket basically right and you can easily see that also using a wireframe so that's one of the things the other thing is you might say what if I want this hole to go all the way to the other end of the object how would you do that so um, one way is just keep increasing this until that preview, yellow preview, comes out of the other face, right? So if you see it from the side view like this, just keep increasing until what? It comes out of the other side. Then when you do it, definitely it will cut the whole object for you like that. Okay, another way is instead of providing a number or if you know the amount of you know the amount of that extrusion another way without you specifying any number is instead of blind you say true all okay this is really good so it just cuts it all the way through without caring how much of extrusion it had so say true all and that does the job so that's the option of true all okay so I talked about that too. Now, one of the things I want you to pay attention is when you do cut extrudes, in CAD, you can make cut extrudes any way that you want. You can make the corners of a cut extrude as sharp as you want, okay? You see sharp edges, sharp corners. In real life, when you want to achieve that using a uh, basically CNC machine, when the tool goes down and tries to cut this material out, this tool has a radius. And when it passes through corners, that radius of the tool will be there. You'll never get rid of that radius. So you always have a fillet at the corners. How much is the radius of that fillet? Equal to the radius of the tool. Okay, so you can never in real life get super sharp corners okay with cnc machines it's impossible okay with printers you can get much closer but with cnc machines it's not doable uh, if it's a very small thin part then there are some cutting presses that you just press on the object to get it but that's assuming most of the time that this cut is through the whole object if it's just a partial cut like this Probably even those uh, cutting press machines are not going to work. So you have to resort for a metal. You have to resort to CNC and CNC can always give you a rounded corner. So just keep that in mind. Plus, sharp corners, when you design them in real life, they cause something called stress concentration, which increases the stress in the part and reduces the uh, actual life of the part. So the part with sharp corners would fail and would break much faster and easier than the ones with round corners. So it's not really good practice in your design to have sharp corners. Okay. So here, instead of this, I might prefer what? Whether I go to the sketch I used for the cut extrude, right? And use this uh, fillet and fill it the corners right so let's say here point two and then maybe this one as well right and this one so i show you three of them and then get out right so now you see these three 
edges are rounded. This one, this one, and this one. This three is still sharp. Now, not only you can modify the sketch of the cut extrude to make a, a sharp edge rounded, there is also a similar command in 3D, a similar command called fillet. And this command is used to directly apply to the 3D without having any sketch. So I just click on the fillet and then I choose the edge that I want. So I choose this edge and I can also choose this edge and then I can also choose what? This one. I provide the amount of radius for the fillet. We'll talk more about this. And then there we go. You see? And now if you look at it from the top, there is no difference between these fillets. The ones that I did directly with the fillet command, the one that I modified the underlying sketch. Okay, now I want to jump a little bit forward and show you another way to create hollow parts. And that is the command shell. Okay, so let's talk about shell. So in this case, let's say I want to make this really like a pipe. Okay, so I want to hollow out this the face, the parts, the two extrudes and make it like a hollow shell. So um, let me get rid of this cut extrude and the fillet. So I right click and delete. Okay, like that. And then, so how do I do that? Well, I need to go here and then create a circle, right? So I choose this boundary here and then go with offset inward. And then let's say I want the thickness of 0.4 for the walls like that. Inward. And then I cut extrude this through all. So I get this one hollow. Then I go here and repeat the same thing. And again, so I choose this one, 0.4, reverse, get out, and then cut extrude this one. Just make sure you do not cut extrude it too much that it cuts the other part. And there we go. So now I will get this pipe here. So in order to get this, I needed to have what? Two separate sketches, provide the wall thickness separately, and then do the cut extrude, exactly knowing how much I should do cut extrude. One of them was through all, one of them was probably up to surface or some blind, but not big enough. And I get this. Another way to do it is the, using the shell command. And shell command is very useful when the cuts that you want to make have the same shape as the extrude. So here the sketches for the extrudes were what? Circular and the cuts that you are making are also circular. And the thickness of the wall all over the part is uniform. Okay, so if you have a part that is actually a shell as the command itself says, it's a shell, it's an object with a specific thickness all around then instead of all these different cut extrudes, you can do it way faster and simpler. And um, you can simply use the shell command. So here I click on the shell command here. And then I say I want a shell with thickness of 0.4. And it says, fine, which faces do you want me to remove? And I say I want this one, this one, and this one, get rid of them for me and provide that wall thickness. And there we go, done, the same result. Okay, so this command is extremely powerful. Again, when two conditions are there. One, the thickness all over the part is the same. Two, when uh, the shape of the cutting part is the same as the shape of the extruded part. Okay, so if you want to cut, let's say, like the previous example, a hexagon inside the circle, that's not doable with the shell command. You have to do it with what? With the uh, cut extrude command. So cut extrude is more powerful in general, but the, and uh, it, 
you can cut as much as you want, not necessarily all the way through the object. So you see, cut extrude is more powerful, but of course you need sketch. Shell command does not need the sketch. Another thing you have, so we learned that if you want to modify a extrude, an extrude, basically you can either modify the sketch or modify the way that you extrude it, right? So edit feature or edit sketch. There is another way that you can also modify extrude, especially the orientation of it or the location of it by editing the plane of the sketch, okay? So sometimes, let's say here, I go to the front plane, right? And then I create a simple cylinder like that. Okay. And then you look back and see, well, actually the cylinder was vertical. In other words, instead of me starting the sketch on the front plane, I should have started the sketch on what? On the top plane and then extruded upward. So I chose the plane for the initial sketch wrong. I started on the wrong plane. What would you do in that case? Would you delete everything and redo it from scratch? No, you don't need to. If that's the only problem, you open the object to see the extrude, you open the extrude uh, to see the sketch of the extrude, I'm sorry. And then when you right click on that, next to edit sketch, you have another option. It says edit sketch plane. So you click here and then says, well, I did it on front plane. What do you want? So here you click on the feature manager and then say, well, actually I wanted it on the top plane. There we go. Yes. So that is a very good way to change the plane of the part. Okay. So that is very, very useful. Okay. So I mentioned that one. The other nice thing that we have is draft. So let's talk about draft. And the other thing I want to mention is, um, I guess I mentioned delete and absorb feature, but I need to talk about suppress one time. So before that, let me talk about the suppression and then we talk about draft. So here I made this object and again, I can go on the top plane and create something, right? And then cut it out. Like that. So now, as I said, under the spec tree, right, under the tree, each one of these features is shown and they are shown in the way that, in the time manner, in the chronological manner that you made them. So the first feature you made is on the top, the second feature is below that and so on and so forth. Now, uh, two important things. One, when you want to delete something, I mentioned it, I reemphasize, when you right click and say delete, if you don't check this option, absorb features, only the feature would go away, the sketch stays. If you do this one, then also the sketch will go away. So if you don't want to delete the sketch, just that feature, then do not check this. Now, sometimes you do not want to delete this. You just want to get it out of the way. You want to hide it. You want to disable it, suppress it temporarily to see what's the effect of that, right? So what you do is you right click on this and then use the option for suppress next to edit sketch here. And when you do that, you see here, it's as if it's not there, it's gone. Although on the tree, you can see this feature exists, but it's grayed out. Grayed out means it's suppressed. But anytime I want, I right click on it and then use what? Unsuppress and I bring it back. So if you do not want to delete something, don't, please. If you just want to temporarily see the effect of that feature being hidden or out of the way, just suppress it. Or you can right click on that also and say what? 
hide. The problem with the hide is if the features depend on each other, then when you hide one, the rest of them will hide two. Why this happened here? Because the sketch that you basically used to create this cutex root was done on what? Right, the sketch was done on the top surface of the original extrude. So these two depend on each other, okay? They are not completely independent. The sketch of the second feature is on the end plane of the first feature. So when they depend on each other, you hide one, the other one hides two, right? So here, you see, if I hide this bus extrude two, also the cut extrude would go away as well, okay? So hide might not be the best option when the features depend on each other. The best way I suggest is to suppress something. Another way to suppress a feature is if it's at the bottom of the tree, you can use this roll back bar and just drag it and move it to above that feature. Anything that is below this roll back bar will be grayed out. Anything that is above it will be active. Okay. And anytime you want, you can bring it back and it's going to be activated right or you just can right click on it and say what roll to the end and it goes back to the end of the tree so that's another way to uh, do it using roll back bar of course roll back bar just goes from the bottom to the top okay so if you want to suppress something in the middle you cannot do that right so let's say here i create a fillet now I want to suppress this one. I cannot do it without undoing the fillet. Because if you see, when I go up, first the fillet goes away, then the cut extrude. But somebody might say, well, don't mess up with the fillet, just get rid of the cut extrude. So you right click on the cut extrude and suppress that, but the fillet stays. So to me, using the suppress directly is way better than um, the um, rollback bar. Okay. So I talked about that. Another thing that matters a lot is reordering these parts if needed. So what do I mean by that? Let me show you. So let's say here when I wanted to do this cut extrude, instead of using this elongated hole, I wanted to use another sketch and then do the cut, right? So let's say i wanted to um, go here or even not on this plane on another plane so um, let's say on the top plane and i wanted to use that sketch that's i'm making right now and use that one for the cut. Okay, so I delete this cut extrude, or not even delete it, I open it up with edit feature, and then here, the sketch that was this guy, I want to change it and say no, use that uh, rectangle that I just drew on the uh, bottom face, right? So under selected contour, if you go, this is actually your contour, all right? But no, I do not want this. Actually, what I want is the um, rectangle, right? But you cannot even see that rectangle here. You just made it, but you cannot see it, okay? You can see it here if you go to the... Uh, feature manager design tree and then you can see there is some sketch here but you cannot select it you see i click on it nothing happens why because in the order of the tree this sketch is made after i made this cut extrude so if i want to modify this cut extrude i cannot use the sketch that comes in the future you cannot go in the future okay it's like traveling in time forward you cannot do that. If I want to be able to use that sketch, this sketch should have been made before this cut extrude 
so that now I can choose it as my sketch of the cut extrude. But since it made afterwards, I cannot use it unless I drag this guy and bring it what? Reorder. I move it behind or before the cut extrude if it allows me to. Yes. So I moved it up. Now it seems like this one is made before the cut extrude. So now if I go to cut extrude, okay, instead of that sketch, I want this one to be my uh, selected sketch. So let me uh, use this one instead. Okay, and um, let's see. So if I choose this one instead, if it allows me to select that and get rid of this, let's see if it can cancel that for me, or I can actually delete that, that's fine, delete the feature only, uh, well, no, it's not a good idea, let me keep that. So uh, I want to use this as my reference. So I go to cut extrude. Then I can use this. The problem is the sketch plane is up here and that guy is not on the sketch plane. So that caused some issue unless I project this onto my sketch plane. So when I go here to uh, edit the sketch, I use that one and then use convert entity and then get uh, let me first get rid of the elongated hole and then I use this one to project it now I can use this one as my uh, profile okay well again look if this sketch was after the extrude, I cannot use it. I cannot even do that convert entity. Look here. If I go here and try to edit that sketch, look. You see, I cannot access that rectangle to project it onto this plane. Why? Again, because that one is made after the cut extrude. Okay, so the order does matter. So if I want to use something here, I move it behind. And now, as I said, I can get rid of this and I can project that onto this plane and there we go. Yes, so the order does matter. Uh, one of the things, as I said, important is draft. So let me add one about reordering items on the tree. Okay, so I will add one more thing for you here to have my notes complete. One other command you have is draft and draft is to provide angle to the faces if you haven't done it or if you just want some of the faces to be drafted. What do I mean by that? Let me show you. So here, let me make this a cube instead of a cylinder so that I can demonstrate it better. Something like this, right? Now I can go to features and then I can click on the draft command right above shell. And it says, okay, about which direction, which face. So I say, well, I want you to draft this face for me. Okay, and then I provide some angle, let's say 10 degrees. Now it did not accept it from me because I did not provide the draft direction. So I say, well, let's choose uh, here if it allows me to select an edge. Is this a direction you need? Can I use this for the normal? Yes. So it choose, should choose the normal to that face as the direction of the draft angle. 
And now let's see. Here we go. Yes, so I gave it 10 degrees draft angle. Right? You might wonder the extrude command by itself give you an option to do draft, right? You remember that the extrude command does give you a draft option that you can see here. What's the difference? When you do draft here, all of the faces of the extrude will be drafted. Right? So you see here, if I say 10 degrees, all of the faces will be drafted like that. But what if I only want one face or two or three faces, not all of them to be drafted? What would you do? Well, that's what I said. You choose the face to be or faces to be drafted. You provide the draft angle and that does the job. So here I did only this face. I could add one more face. So let's say I want both of these faces to be drafted 10 degrees. There we go now. Yes, so two faces drafted. The two others are not. Correct? You can easily see that. If I just show you from this view and then this view. Okay, so it is more general than the draft index through. Okay, so before we move to the revolve and cut revolve features, let's a little bit more talk about fillets. Because what we have seen so far was basically um, edge fillet. So I want to talk a little bit more about different options for fillet. So this is a uh, cube. And uh, as I showed you, you can select any edge that you want. So let's say this edge here, and then say, fill it that with 0.05, right? Like that. Or you can select several of them if you want, and do the same thing. Now, those edges will be filleted, the others won't. But if you select a face, the total face, then all the edges will be filleted like that. Uh, the other thing is there are other types of fillet. So this fillet that we have done is with constant fillet size or fillet radius. There is one that you can have variable size fillet. So if you choose that, okay, and then say I want to fillet this guy here, then it gives you basically some control points. Right? right now you have V1 and V2, the beginning point and the end point. And then it is going to change the radius between basically uh, uh, point V1 and point V2 using, in this case, a basically linear uh, formula. Okay, so... Here, let's say you click on V1 and it says the radius, you assign it and you say, okay, this is 0.5. Okay, and uh, so here, 0.5. And then you click here for radius at point V2 and you set that, let's say, 1. So now the radius is going to change linearly between 0.5 and 1. And you can see that here, right? So you can have variable uh, fillet. And uh, the other thing you can have is actually, you see here, you have in general, you can have three more points. So in overall, five points instead of... Um, Three, and so you can assign all five of them. So here, let's say I want to go with 0.5. And then here at the 25% of the curve, I want to go with like 0.7. Uh, 0.7. And then here I can go with 0.8. Can move them to see them and then here go with 1.3 and finally here go with like 2. So you see I'm not changing them perfectly linearly right. 
So it's not linear from beginning to the end. And now you see it is going to be linear piecewise, right? We call it piecewise linear. So that's another way to do. Uh, one other option is called um, full round fillet. So it takes, uh, it fillets basically an entire face out. What does that mean? It means here you choose, let's say, this face, and then you choose this other face, and then for the face to go away, you choose this one. Okay, so uh, let's see. Select connected faces. I guess I did. Unless. Oh, the middle one should be the one that goes away. So I have to reverse the order. So uh, the middle one is the one that goes away. And then this is going to be this one. So phase one and three would stay. Phase two here. Actually, it's phase three. But the top face will be filleted away like that. Okay, So that's another fillet option that I wanted to talk about. And later I'll talk about the, uh, uh, actually this is a simple face fillet, so you can have one face or you can have basically a couple of faces and then it will create a fillet and merge them together. So I'll talk about that later when we get to a relevant uh, feature. Just wanted to show you that fillet has so many different options in 3D. So, so far, we have seen how to create objects that are basically prism, right? Basically, they have a constant cross-section as you move along the axis of extrusion. Or you can give them a draft and make the cross-section shrink or increase in size. You can basically hollow them out with cut extrude or shell. And you can have fillet and chamfer. So, this is what we have seen. But now... We can focus on a specific group of parts where they are round objects and they have an axis of symmetry. Okay, so if you have the silhouette of the object, the profile, and revolve it around the axis of symmetry, you can have this round objects. And you don't need to necessarily do a full revolution. You can only have a portion of the revolution. You can even make them thin, right? So you can apply wall thickness. So let me show you some of the parts. There are a lot of parts in real life that basically can be made by Revolve. So here uh, is a very rough uh, picture of, you might call it a chess piece or I don't know, a salt shaker or something, but simpler shapes like what? Like a uh, basically, cylinder like a sphere like a torus so many other shapes exist that i can create for you even a, a cone that i can create and uh, revolve around an axis so let me show you that so this is what we do i use the same rectangle right i have this rectangle now i say i want to revolve this about so it says what x what sketch i say this one right revolve and then says what is your axis of revolution i say this side there we go right that's a cylinder so i can make a cylinder by revolving the uh, side view of the cylinder which is a rectangle actually half of it about the uh, axis of symmetry and um, as I said, you don't need to do full revolution. So you can just go in direction one or direction two as much as you want. Right. So let's say just in direction one, I want to go 250 degrees. And you can see the result of that. And I can uh, even provide a thickness. So once you make it, you cannot provide thickness. So you have to do it again. Once you make a revolve, you cannot go back and provide thickness. But in the beginning, if you want, you can. So it gives you this thin feature. So here I say this is the axis of revolution. I want it to just let's go 230 degrees or anything like that. And then I give it some thickness for the wall. Okay. And 
uh, let's see. Oh, so the contour intersects the center line. So reduce it or reverse the direction. Yes, there we go. So always make sure you read the uh, errors. And that's what you get, all right? So uh, there are lots of things, as I said, that you can make by revolving. Like, as I said, a cylinder, if you just change that to a triangle, then of course you can uh, basically create a cone, right? So that's all you need. A triangle. Just make sure your sketch is closed. Actually, let me do it one more time. Like that. Then simply what? Revolve it about this axis and get a cone. If you make that sketch a semicircle closed, so something like this, a line, and then a three-point arc like that at 180-degree angle like this. So then you get what? A sphere. If you make it half ellipse, you can get an ellipsoid, right? So there are lots of things that... You can do now if you want a torus like a donut shape basically what you need is a circle like that and then your axis of revolution should be out of the circle so here in a separate sketch I'll go and create a center line off the circle and so now I say revolve this guy for me around this axis there we go I get the donut shape okay so there are so many things as I said many chess pieces not all of them but many of them can be created using this revolve method and then with cut revolve actually the opposite of that you can go around something and cut and you might wonder where is it in real life that I create basically a cut revolve. So one example is the head of a um, hex bolt or a hex knot. So let me show you that. So if you have seen the head of a hex bolt or a hex knot, The head does not have round, the head does not have sharp edges actually. So if you can see here in this picture or this picture or this one, you can see that around this you have this kind of feature that uh, removes those a little bit of the sharp edges and it has these curves that go around so if you want to make that feature which is common in any hex bolt or hex knot that's a cut revolve okay so if you want to make a hex a bolt basically let's say we go to the top plane and then we draw a hexagon make sure that one of the vertices is right above the origin like this okay and then you extrude this to make the head like that okay so that's the basic of the head but as i said you have to have that round feature all around it and in order to do so, you need to draw a triangle and then revolve it all around the top of the bolt's head or the knot and cut it out. So here, I need to choose one of the side planes, either front or right. Which one? The one that when you choose it and see normal to it, you see three faces. So here you see, I can see three faces. So that's the right plane to draw your cutting profile. 
if you choose the other one which is front and see normal to it you only see what two faces that's the wrong plane the plane that's when you see normal to it you see three faces of the hex head that's the right plane so i go to the right plane and start the sketch and it is a right triangle it is a right triangle with the two endpoints being on the top edge and the right edge or the left edge doesn't matter okay and then the corner of it be the corner of the top right or top left corner of the hex bolt like that okay so that is your uh, x uh, your profile that should go around now uh, we need an axis also in the center to uh, revolve this guy around it so again i need to go to this plane one more time and draw my axis of revolution because it's symmetric so now i choose this sketch and i say cut revolve or revolve cut about this axis and there we go okay so i'll keep this because we need to work on it i when i want to go to cut sweep i want to talk about it so this is what you make the head of a hex bolt and then on this bottom surface basically you need to have the um, shaft right so you have a circle and then you extrude that something like this of course these all have dimensions i'm just doing it rough so this is going to be the very basic of a hex bolt and also the bottom of any hex bolt has a chamfer so you need to do a chamfer at this bottom edge not face actually face here does do the same thing so it does not matter so much that was too big again these all have dimensions when we talk later about uh, parametric design i'll talk about them so here we go right so this is just the rough draft of thing and actually here also it is not super sharp like this so here you also have a small fillet okay so that is the base and then i'll show you later how to create the thread on this guy so anyway that's revolve and cut revolve now uh, before i get into sweep and cut sweep i want to talk a little bit about curves which is an interesting feature of its own in part design as we'll need that later especially helix and uh, not a spiral helix so let me at least talk about helix and uh, then we'll go through the rest of the examples so if you go here so let me make a new one i'll keep that hex bolt if when you are in the features tab in the part design you have reference geometry where you can define plane axis coordinate system and so on and you also have curves where you can have curves through xyz point we'll talk about this in the next lecture in parametric design and you also can have helix and spiral so helix and spiral are basically two different things helix is a 3d curve it's not a 2d you cannot draw it in the sketch okay in sketch if you know the formula you can do a spiral because the spiral is flat but helix is not okay and i assume everybody knows the difference between them so helix is basically a circle that also moves up and down as uh, the curve revolves but uh, spiral is in the plane and just the radius of it changes right so Just want to make sure everybody knows that so you can exactly see this 3d curve is helix this 2d flat curve is spiral so and both of them can actually be used for torsional springs so in torsional springs okay that's used in toys in many other applications you have both of these guys right both of these shapes can be used 
to create what? And that's what I said. In a torsional spring, which is this one, this is a helix, and then this is what? A spiral, and this is also a helix, and this tension spring is also a helix. So I want to create a helix right now and make a compression spring like this, show you how you can make it. And then probably you can do the spiral one yourself. So uh, as you can see, when I click on helix and spiral, first it asks me to choose a plane for the base of it. Let's say I choose the top plane. And then you need to draw a circle that is the base of the helix. So let's say I draw a circle like this and I get out. And then if I see in 3D, now it is trying to build a um, helix on the top of that circle. So basically when you look from the top, the helix and the spiral are on the top of each other. If you don't give it a draft angle, you see, but when you look from the side, Circle is flat, but helix keeps going up. Now, there are different ways to define the helix, pitch and revolution, height and revolution, height and pitch, and so on. So typically height and pitch are good ones or pitch and revolution. Pitch here is the distance between each point and the next corresponding point. So basically, if I come here, right, or if I go, uh, here, so the distance between each point and the next point, right? The next corresponding point. The distance between any point and the point on the next elevation, basically, this distance is called a pitch, right? So from here to here, here to here, here to here, here to here, okay? So the bigger the pitch, the wider the uh, turns are and uh, the spring is going to be like it is already stretched. So here you provide the pitch, let's say I go one inches, right? So you can clearly see the effect, right? When I make it bigger, you can see what's happening. And then you tell it how many revolutions to go. So you can clearly see this guy is, uh, keep going up. Let's say one, five revolutions, right? And then you can change your start angle which actually I can show you here probably. So look at the start point. When I change the start angle, it basically is the angle between the line that connects that point to the center with respect to a fixed reference. Okay, so you can choose any angle that you want for the start angle. You can also give it a, a tapper angle so you can make the radius of this uh, circle each circle with respect to the next the radii is to get bigger or smaller okay so you see i can make a tapered spring like that and you can make it taper outward or taper inward okay so there we go i got this helix again pay attention that helix is a 3d curve you cannot make it in sketch okay now if i want to make a spring the next thing I need is I need to have a profile and the profile, whatever the profile of the spring is, let's say a circle, that circle has to follow this helix. <coughs> we call it sweeping and create the spring. <coughs> So the next step is to use a new command called sweep for creating basically a swept surface or you can do cut sweep to cut something and I'll do cut sweep later for thread of the bolt. <coughs> so here, first I need the profile to follow this curve, the guide curve. On which plane do I draw it? Well, it should be on a plane that is normal to this helix at some point. So I need a customized plane. So I go on the reference geometry and click on plane. It says, okay, what's your first reference? I say helix. So now it says, okay, do you want it perpendicular? That's the only option I have. And you say, fine. And then says, do you have, do where do you want to point it along this normal to this helix at which point? You say at the beginning point or the end point. You have two points to select. And you also say, set some origin on the curve for me. 
and then you okay that and now you can go on this plane and create your sketch so now you see it is putting some origin at that point for you and now you draw a circle make sure it is concentric with the origin point and then provide a profile now one important thing about this profile is it should not be so big that if you basically let me give it the dimension so let's say i make this 2.5 so if i come on the next point which is here so i go down or up by a pitch and i come here and draw the same circle because the circle is supposed to follow that curve so it when it goes down by one pitch then it comes here right so now if i draw the same circle same size at the next pitch point look at that at the next uh rightmost point basically these two circles overlap so when this object this profile is following the guide it is going to intersect itself it says um, solidworks gives you an error it says the sweep is self intersecting so make sure that you never make this big enough that the next one and this one would intersect okay so 2.5 is too big if it's a circle then the radius of the circle basically should be less than what half of the pitch okay so that the diameter is equivalent to less than a pitch so here that is too big maybe i need to make it like 1.5 or so right so if i put another 1.5 here and there is a good chance that they do not basically intersect and i don't think they do right so you see there is no problem so just make sure that the sweep does not self intersect so now that's ready to go i hide this plane and get it out of the way so now i go under features i use the sweep command sweep bus space and i use this for the profile and then i use this for the guide curve and there we go i got my spring now and i can hide the helix if i don't need it there we go that's a tapered spring basically course very simple it's not that simple but uh because they always cut the bottom and make it flat right so because the bottom of it needs to need to sit on something so they need to cut the bottom of it or actually push this bottom with some smaller pitch to make it flat okay so the bottom of the spring is typically not exactly like that when you look at them uh let me show you one Where is my spring? I just saw it somewhere. Okay, fine. Compression springs. So if you look, basically the top of it and the bottom of it, the pitch is different than the rest of it. You can clearly see, or they are cut. They are cut so that they can sit on a flat surface okay so many of them are cut you can clearly see that here you see clearly there is a cut here and if you want to do that here basically you have to do a cut extrude right so you have to come on this plane let's say and then uh, you have to draw a rectangle And then you do a cut extrude. Okay, that cuts the entire object. So I guess if I go this way and go through all, that should do the job. Although to make sure, I can also go direction two and go through all. And you're going to get something like this. 
Okay, it's not perfect, but uh, this bottom part is flat. It can sit on something. So uh, this is a sweep. Now a cut sweep basically does the opposite. The profile follows the guide and cut something out. And that's something that you can do to basically create the thread, right? Whether on a shaft or inside the hole, right? To do tapping or die, yeah, that's basically what it is. So let me show you that on this bolt here. So that's what I want to do. So first I need a helix. And for the helix, I need a plane to start the helix on. So what I can do is first, I create a plane on which to start the helix. And I make it a little bit above the chamfer plane. Here, so I make it a little above that, and now I guess this one is good to uh, use for the circle of the helix. So I go under curves, helix spiral, my plane is already set. All I need is to use a circle, and I guess the circle is already good, right? That's the circle of the shaft, so I choose it and then use convert entity. And here we go. The, uh, Helix is there already. Now it's tapered. I don't want tapper. Also, I want it backwards. So reverse the direction. And the pitch is too big. I'll make it smaller. Probably an inch would do the job for me. And then I use more revolutions. Nine, probably. Okay, or if I don't want to thread the whole thing, then I bring it down. Not all uh, bolts are threaded all the way to the top. Maybe six thread. Okay, so that's my helix with the radius exactly equal to the radius of the shaft. I don't want this plane, so I'll get it out of the way, hide it. And now I create a customized plane which is normal to the helix at this beginning point. And I ask it to set origin for me. Now I go on this normal plane, I create a sketch, and then I draw my cutting profile, which typically is a triangle. Okay, so I can use, if I want an equilateral triangle, I use a polygon, and then I change the number of sides to three instead of six. So I click here and then I draw a triangle. Again, not too big that it overlaps with itself, right? Something like that. And then make this line vertical, right? And many threads, they also have this tip point curved or cut out. So many of them are kind of like this actually. They are not pure sharp unless they are wood screws. So if I want, I can get rid of this part. So they are actually trapezoids. And uh, now I go to features and then I do a swept cut. And it says, what is your sketch? I say this trapezoid. What is your guide curve? The helix. And Yeah, it goes a little into the chamfer, but I can fix that. That's fine. There we go. Now, you see clearly here that was uh, not big enough, so I did not get a nice thread. Threads, they all have dimensions, and I can easily change that, so it's not a big deal. All you need is to change your cutting profile, okay? So it's not basically uh, big enough. You have to make it big enough to give you sharper cuts, okay? So you might need to increase the size. So let me choose this to be an inch, probably too big. But anyways, I'll move this to here. Let's also give this a dimension, 0.8. Okay, let's see now. Okay, a little better, too deep. <sighs> Let's 
So in general, there's a rule for that. Again, I'm not getting into the rules in this lecture, but the rule is the size of this triangle from here to here, this point 0.8 should be actually 0.866 times the pitch. So it should be a little bigger, 0.866 times the pitch. So pitch is one inch. That should be something like that. And uh, I have a coincidence here, so it's not going to do much. As you can see, right? If you make this sketch visible, that can help you understand what is going on here. So that's what you're cutting, okay? So in order to remove the, uh, make it smaller, reduce the size of this thread, this triangle has to come down with the next triangle and they should be very close to each other, okay? So one way is to bring this further in, okay? Although that makes them quite deep. So um, if I don't go with this coincidence, and shift this guy a little bit forward in hopefully it doesn't intersect with itself we'll see now so you see now you are getting basically um, this so again the pitch and everything is related to this diameter here one inch is too high for the size of this circle so maybe i can go and reduce my pitch that is too big of a pitch so i'll okay and now you're going to get error most probably because your triangles are too big they intersect with themselves so don't be surprised if you do that's why this guy is thinking I don't think it can find a solution. You have to go back and update. Okay, so now you can see clearly this cut sweep is not effective. It is red, which means it's not going to happen. So you have to go back and change your sketch. So this thing, now I make it 0.866 times 0.5. And the same thing with this one probably 0.4 okay a little better let me there is something wrong with the sketch i need to fix that clearly can see that here um, 0.4 is too much 0.3 something like that or maybe a little bigger let's see now there we go it's a little better so now this looks like a power bolt the one that are used in jack of the cars for lifting objects so this is not something that is used for cutting objects so this is the example of a standard thread that i made using actual dimensions and i'll show you later but you clearly can see that the threads are quite sharp they are not still for uh, cutting something, but they are much sharper than uh, the one that I showed you. And it all goes back to the sketch that you use and the um, dimensions for the helix and everything. So just wanted to you to see that. Now let's talk a little bit about standard holes that are done with drilling standard drills and then creating threads on or in them which in uh, real life we do it using uh, taps or dies right so when you want to uh, first you drill the hole and then if you want thread inside it then you use this device which is called what a tap and you attach the tap to a, uh, a holder like this and then you start basically 
uh, spinning that and creating the threads. This is very specific type of steel, okay, it's, uh, tool steel, very sharp, very hard, and it can cut inside softer material. Or if you want to create threads on the shaft of a bolt, then you use this device here, okay, this uh, kind of disc object. Inside it, it has threads, we call it a die, and you put it again inside its own holder device, and then you spin that device and create the threads. Again, the material for the die is like tap, it's hard tool steel, okay? It's way typically harder than the bolt or the uh, internal surface of the knot. So this is how you do it in real life. Now in SolidWorks, when you want to create threads, as I said, a simplistic way to do it is, uh, or non-standard way to do it is the cut sweep. Of course, you can make the cut sweep method standard by making sure that all of these dimensions, the dimensions for helix and the dimensions for the cutting profile and everything, they are following the standards for that thread. Then yes, you can actually make a standard bolt or a standard knot just using the cut sweep method. But if the shaft is of standard size itself and you want a standard thread, the one that you find in stores, if you want to create those, then the whole command or the thread command allow you to create those without you doing any cut sweep. So they do the cut sweep by themselves and give you standard threads. Okay, the one that are used in industry and you can find on the shelf of... Uh, different hardware stores. So without uh, going too much into detail, I just tell you a little bit about some terminologies about threads, because we need to know a little bit at least about them before we can make them. So if this is a thread, let's say this is a bolt that has threads, as I told you, this is actually a helix, right? And then the angle between the uh, tangent to the helix and the normal to the axis of revolution, we call it the helix angle. Then, uh, as I said, the distance between each peak point to the next peak point or each root point to the next root point, we call it pitch. Then we have the angle of the cutting profile. If it's a triangle, we call that angle the thread angle. Most of the time is 60 degrees, but not always. The distance between the tip of the thread to the bottom of the thread, we call it depth of the thread. The diameter from basically root to root, we call it minor diameter. The diameter from tip to tip, we call it major diameter. And then the pitch diameter, which is the average of the two. So, uh, and then we call the tips, we call them crest instead of tips. So we have root and crest. So these are some terminologies that you need to know. Now there are two types of bolts in the market, okay, the off the shelf ones. There are two types, metric ones and imperial ones. The metric one, basically the way that you describe the screw or bolt is starting with letter M, followed by a number, then times another number. So when you say M4 times 0.7, what does that mean? This four is in millimeters, the major diameter of the thread. So the major diameter is full mil, and then 0.7 is the pitch, okay? So the pitch is 0.7 mil. Okay, so when you say I want an M4, times 0.7 thread, the uh, seller would know what you are looking for. In the imperial system, okay, what you do is you don't have letter M or anything. You directly start with the major diameter in inches. So when you say a quarter, it means a quarter inch major diameter. And then you have a number here, which is not pitch, but actually it's the number of pitches or the number of threads per one inch, TPI, thread per inch. 
So when I say 20, what does it mean about the pitch? This pitch is 1 over 20 because there are 20 of these threads or 20 pitches in 1 inch. So the pitch itself is reciprocal of this number, 1 over 20 or 0.05 inches. And then there are different types of uh, threads for the same major diameter. So there are two types of threads. They both have the same diameter, but one of them has a, a bigger pitch. One of them has a what? Smaller pitch. The smaller the pitch is, the finer the thread. So the category with smaller pitch, but the same diameter, we call them U and F or unified uh, uh, fine thread. And the other one, we call them unified coarse thread, U and C. Okay. So just wanted you to know about if you want to buy a thread, a bolt or a knot, whether it's a metric or uh, the uh, imperial system, which uh, nomenclature you should be using, what is a tap, what is a die, in some terminologies, right? The other thing that is important before I talk about the hole and thread command is tap drill charts. This is really important. So if you want, let's say an M4 thread, right? Let's say you want an M4 thread inside the hole, right? So the major diameter is four mil. You want to create this thread inside the hole using a tap. What drill size do you choose? Because first you have to drill it, then tap it. So if the distance from tip to tip of this uh, tap is four mil, right? It's M4. What big is going to be the drill? What is the diameter of the drill bit that you use to cut this? Is it also going to be four? Well, of course not, because if you make it four, then this tap will do nothing on it, right? This hole should always be a little smaller than what? The major diameter of the thread. Otherwise, when you send the tap in, it's just going to pass through it and come out from the other side. It's not going to touch any of the metal or any other material it is, and it's not going to cut. So the drill should be a little smaller than major diameter, okay? For example, let's say uh, if you have basically a metric, I just said M4, right? So if you have M4.7, correct? what is going to be the drill size that you would use and it tells you that the drill size for that should be what as you can see here the drill size for it should be 3.3 okay so you're not going to drill it with four millimeter drill bits you drill it with 3.3 millimeter, uh, millimeter drill bit okay or in equivalent in inches that's going to be your number Okay, so it's very important to know what drill size you choose for what kind of thread. Okay, and I provided you this uh, small sample here, but if you want to know about more threads, because these are just a few threads, you can go to our Canvas page here. And if you go under Modules and go down under Tutorials, then I have this one for you. It says tap drill size chart. Okay, so it is very important. Okay, and this document has several pages. I just uh, basically copied a little bit of that for you. So you, you can see the metric threads and also you see what? Imperial threads here. Yeah. Both of these are available to you. Okay, so depending on which type of thread you want, the drill, the corresponding drill size is provided. So uh, if you want to do a real project, make sure you observe this important thing. So now, as I said, SolidWorks has a tool that will create for you the uh, uh, drill size for the specific thread size. So the command is the whole wizard, and there is also a thread command. So let me show you what we do. So these are standards, okay, not arbitrary. So 
here. I will create something very simple for you first. And now, instead of me using a cut extrude to apparently make a hole, you know, when you drill a hole, the bottom of the drill is not like cut extrude, right? So when you have a drilled hole, the bottom of it is conic shape, right? If you can look at the bottom of a, a threaded uh, hole, the bottom of it here, the bottom of it is actually conic shape. It's not just flat. Well, when you do cut extrude, it just goes directly flat. Okay, unless it's a true drill, so it, the drill bit comes out of the other side of the part, then yes, there is no bottom. But if it's just inside the part and it's not completely through, then the bottom of it is conical. Okay, so if I want to have a, a drilled hole, not just a simple cut extrude, so what I do here is I use the um, hole wizard right next to cut extrude. And then I choose one point. Later, I'll show you how to modify the location of it. So I want to create a hole on this top surface. And then here, there are two tabs. One is position, which you have to define the location of it. If you want, I can show you right now. So you click on 3D sketch and now it says, okay, where do you want to put it? So you are using the point command. You put it here, right? And then you can use the dimension tool to basically provide the offsets, right? So you can provide the offset and exactly put it where you want, right? So again, pay attention that the sketch is simply a point. And you provide dimension offset for that point and now it is going to be there right so that's the drill and it finished it so i go back to modify the specifications for it so i go back here modify so that is the drill hole but i don't want it like that so you go down under type you choose what type you want do you want a simple drill hole do you want a countersign? Do you want a counterboard? And so on and so forth. So what is counterboard or countersign here? These are for when the head of the bolt or the screw, you want it flush with the part, okay? So when you have a bolt or a screw that is moved inside the part, you basically on the top of the drill hole, you create a truncated cone cut or a cylindrical cut. This is counterboard, this is countersunk. And then uh, the head of the screw will go inside this and becomes flush with the rest of the surface, okay, instead of just sticking out. So counterboard and countersunk, keep that in your mind. Um, so that was that option. So let's say I want a countersunk. And then it says, okay, do you want ANSI inch? Do you want ANSI metric? Let's say I want ANSI metric. Then it says, okay, what type? Let's say I want a flat head screw. Then what is the size? I say the size I want is an M10. So 10 mil, um, basically diameter. And then uh, end condition, do you want it true? So do you want the cut to go all the way through or do you want a depth? So say now I want a depth and let's say if I look from the side, I just want to go maybe one inch or so. Okay. Right. So we can clearly see this is going to give you a standard hole and let me show you that's the standard hole and if i look at the wireframe i can see it a lot better right so this is the countersign hole that it has created for me yes 
but it does not have threads, but I can create a thread as well using the thread command. So you expand under the whole wizard command and you choose the thread command. And then you choose the top uh, edge of the cylindrical surface you want to create the thread inside. And then you go and uh, choose the type. So I use metric. So I use metric. Make sure it's tap, not die, because it's an internal thread. And then that was 10 mil diameter. So here I choose M10. And you see M10 has three different pitches, one, 1 1.25, and 1.5. So this is the fine thread. This is medium thread. This is coarse thread. Let's say I want a coarse thread right or i want a fine thread it doesn't matter and then um, it determines exactly what you need to have and then you okay that and there we go these are your threads inside